let's begin. I will show you Terraform and TerraGrant, two excellent tools for infrastructure automation. So, hi at first. I love to have my lectures more interactive. So, if anything is unclear, just ask in between, or maybe I give you some questions. And I speak Ger German and English. I do this talk in English because you wouldn't understand me in German with my dialect. I'm from Austria. <laughs> so you can ask any question in English or in German. That's no problem. Good. I'm Emily. Just for my comfortness, I'm a non-binary person. My pronouns are in English, sei and sehr, or in German, sief or sehr, if you talk about me. So just know them. <laughs> yeah. I work at PixelArt, we are a digital agency, and my job title is called Engineering and Operations. It's, yeah, so just titles. Basically, I do DevOps, many DevOps system administration, cloud administration, internal development, that's the engineering part. We could have called it DevOps. Yeah, Wayne. So, my everyday work is getting up infrastructure, modify them, destroy them, getting up, destroy them, getting up, destroy them. So I don't want to do this by hand, so I have searched for tools, have learned these tools, and I always use them. Even if I have to get up one machine, I code it. By, because if any developer destroys something on this machine, I just take it down and recreate it by script. Yeah. Um, a little disclaimer, these code examples are written for Terraform below or equals 0 0.11 and TerraGrant below or equals 0 0.18. Both tools have released a new version with a new configuration language with, which is a bit different, has a first class level of variables and so on. So if you take these code examples and use the newest Terraform version 0 0.12, you have to adapt them a bit. So the status quo, who is automating his uh, the infrastructure. The rest of you, have you to do something with infrastructure? Yeah, no. And the other persons, developers? Okay. Yeah. So there's this famous model pets versus cattle. Let's look a bit into it as a Intro, yeah. So the pet service model. When you have a pet at home, what do you do with him? Pets have unique names, like Acheron, example, com, um, my notebook is called Acheron. It's, if I remember correctly, one of the four Greek rivers of, yeah, one of the four rivers of Greek mythology, yeah. And your pet, they are cared, unique, lovingly, hand-raised, and cared for. Like your cat at home, you care for your cat. And if you have a server as a pet, you raise it by hand too. You install your packages by hand on the shell, you create a configuration by hand. Yeah. And when they get ill, you nurse them back to health. Like you have some configuration error, you fix it by hand, you get it running back, all by your hand. Like. Don't worry, I'm from tech support. <laughs> On the other side, you have the cattle service model. Like, all your servers, all your cattle are given numbers, like MGNL 05, 06, 07, etc. They are more, almost identical to each other cattle, of course, because they are not hand raised. You automate them to grade them. And when they get ill, you get another one. Like I said before, I destroy them, I regrade it. I just don't give any mind if something is in bad configuration state, if something is destroyed by our developers. I just destroy, destroy the whole machine and regrade it. There are a few exceptions, like your magical unicorn pet server, which can still be under configuration management. You have projects where you have only one server because yeah, enterprise thingy and license costs of 10,000 euros. You have that. So you have this unique pet, but it's still 
upgraded by configuration management, infrastructure management, but I can't destroy it because it's the only production server running. I still have to fix some things by hand. Yeah. So, we have infrastructure as code. This is the kettle service model or your special pet. Infrastructure as code. Who has never heard about this term? Good. Just to <laughs> repeat it, infrastructure as code is reproducible. It's plain defined infrastructure because you have code. It's defined, it has a state, it should have a state, and it's a foundation for DevOps. You can't do DevOps stuff without coded infrastructure. Imagine few servers all raised by hand, all configured by hand. One is different because one of the system engineers hasn't read the wiki exactly and missed a step. So infrastructure as code is a really important foundation for DevOps. And you gain visibility across your infrastructure because you just look in your infrastructure code, you know, oh, I have 10 servers or I use this image, I use these packages. And for all of this, I use Terraform. Yeah, it's readable terraform.io. You can download it, really great documentation. And the documentation is really, really great. I have used tools where the docs are, yeah, in a really bad state or you down, or Stack Overflow are the documentation. No, so Terraform. It's made by HashiCorp. Who has heard of HashiCorp? Yeah, they make Vagrant, they make Pekka, Consul, yeah. The nicest part about Terraform, it has a declarative language. If you compare it to Chef or Ansible, which have a procedural style of infrastructure coding, Terraform is declarative like Puppet. You define your resources and they define the order of execution by themselves. And the HashiCorp configuration language is like a superset of JSON. If you paste JSON in your HashiCorp file, you still have to modify the syntax. But the nice part about this, as a superset of JSON, you can write your Terraform config in JSON2, which I use in a tool to automatically create infrastructure for tenants. I use JSON, scripted by Terraform, and it's done. Projects are raised up and down by simple API calls. Yeah. Let's, who of you has never used Terraform? Perfect. So I give you some, yeah, introduction about Terraform. Terraform has the notation of providers. In this case, I use the provider AWS. Yeah, we use AWS, I'm used to it, so I use this in my examples. In the next talk, in this lecture room, you get a Terraform talk which uses Kubernetes. Yeah, cool. <laughs> so I create the foundation for you. <laughs> yeah, I have a provider, I use variables, AWS access key and secret key. I can provide the keys on the command line. Don't use static credentials on the command line. So I can configure the provider only with the region, can supply the secrets key by environment variables. Every provider has a good documentation which environment variables are read in instead of the configuration parameters. Or that's not really better. So it depends on the provider how you can configure it. Like AWS provider, you have your .aws credentials file, which is, which is also read by Terraform. So I have my access key, I have my secret key, and Terraform will read in that file. Standard AWS configuration. Kubernetes has many other configuration modes too. Sorry. Um, yeah, every provider has its own documentation, so you have to read it if you switch providers. Even on, yeah. Using each provider has different resources, so it's not exactly exchangeable. If you have scripted your AWS infrastructure, you can't exactly use it for Google Cloud or Azure. But the big part about Terraform is you have many, many providers. Azure, you have a HTTP provider. I don't know what that does do. 
you have a DNS provider to read in C names, Bitbucket, Brightbox, InfluxDB if you want, many cloud providers and service tools. Like, do I see it? No. Yeah. I was searching for a few DNS providers. I don't see it on the list, but it's nice. Ah, PowerDNS. If you configure your infrastructure, don't want to use root 53, but you can configure IP addresses into PowerDNS. So with Terraform, you're not only configuring one provider, you can configure your infrastructure across many cloud providers, many cloud SaaS tools. Yeah. So let's continue with the introduction. So we have resources. One resource, AWS instance called my instance. I define an AMI image, the instant types, and few tags. You can have variables in Terraform uh, with default, AWS region, AWS AMI. These variables can be read and from a tfvars file or from the command line, or even from environment variables in a special syntax. But to advance in the talk, don't really need to know this. <laughs> yeah. Terraform usage is really simply. You can plan your Terraform run, you can apply your Terraform run, and you can destroy it. Um, I don't know, I think, from starting from version 0 0.10, apply and destroy has the plan integrated. Before that, you always had to run Terraform plan to know what will Terraform do to your infrastructure. But now, if you run Terraform apply, it will show you the plan which will be executed, and then you can say yes. And it will be applied, it will be destroyed, and so on. The most important part of Terraform is interpolation, which means like I use the variables to interpolate, which is then in 0 0.12 a first class variable without the quotes and the dollar sign around. I can read in files and many other functions, JSON and decoding, no, encoding. Yeah. So I have two resources defined, and those two resources, can you see the black lines? Can you see them? Or more hard than them? So, yeah. Here uh, I use these two resources again. And this is called interpolation. And with this interpolation, Terraform knows which infrastructure has to be created first. So Terraform will first create your AWS Keeper and your security group before it is creating your instance. Because you couldn't create your instance if the security group doesn't exist. And through this declarative language, Terraform computes which is executed. Some resources are executed in parallel. Some resources like um, security group IDs can be executed in parallel and you can get an error because you use the same set of IP address and port, for example. But that all depends on your resources you use. So you can have outputs in Terraform. You need the public IP of your instance, define the output, and can you use it. Um, if you only change your outputs in the Terraform code, you call refresh, and then Terraform output, you don't need to apply. And the best part is you can Terraform output public IP and use it in your script. Any other script, like, you need to execute. Yeah. The typical lay layout of Terraform are TF files, yeah, for Terraform. I have a main TF where I define mostly of my infrastructure, a local for local variables, variable state, provider, bit of split up from the Terraform infrastructure. So, this is how a Terraform run looks. I simply run Terraform apply. This is an older recording. It doesn't show you the Terraform plan, which is executing. This is from a Gmeter fleet configuration where I created, in this case, a smaller Gmeter fleet to execute load testing. So I have called them Gru and Minions. A bit funny. <laughs> yeah. Creation complete, creation complete. And two instances are still grading. As its infrastructure, AWS, takes its time to grade instances. Yeah. 
And then when I've done load testing, I just destroy this infrastructure. I said old recording, no plan output before. It's refreshing the state to see if you already have destroyed your distance instances by yourself. Could be the case. All this state Terraform knows about is saved in a Terraform TF state file. If you don't configure a backend for the Terraform TF state file, it's saved locally in your Terraform directory where you execute this code. You can configure remote states too, which is recommendable if you work with teams. Okay, let's recap that a bit. Terraform is a simply declarative modular tool. It uses many cl cloud providers and SaaS providers and its coded infrastructure. Easy peasy, or? Yeah? I said a bit more interaction. <laughs> okay, let's introduce the next step because you don't want to create your infrastructure in one big Terraform configuration. It's not nice, so Terraform has the possibility of using Terraform modules. With Terraform modules, they are like a container for multiple resources, like the instances I had before. They could be contained in a module, or like security group rules could be contained in a model. They create lightweight abstractions, because if you create a VPC, in AWS, it can get really complicated. So you may want to create a user module for VPC creation, which abstracts you all the hard bits away. And Terraform modules increase overall reusability, which means, okay, you have one VPC, but you may have many security group rules to use them. So Terraform modules can be created in many w and used in many ways. You can have local modules, like I have in my projects. I have an internal directory, and I have many modules, like the data volume, the instance. I have security group rule and security group rules. These security group rules modules use the security group rule, so you can have modules can use modules. Each module has its own files, main TF, outputs, and variables, so input, output, and what is executed. Local modules are referenced by the module attributes. You give them any name you want, but use a good name, like sg for security group dot underscore ssh. Then the source parameter defines how you use, which module is referenced. Sorry, I'm a bit nervous too, still. Um, yeah, this is a local module, so I go one of directory above, use security group rules, ISMP default because ISMP for AWS has many rules in it, for echo, for fragments, etc. Internal modules, like something uh, VPN, you don't want to copy it into every Terraform config. Our VPN configuration is the same for every project. So I have created a Git repository, Terraform Pixlart VPN, just Git. It's versionized, so I can increase, like, we have a new subnet in our local office. I just add it to the module, push a new git tag, and every project can use the 1.6 version. And yeah. But the greatest is the module registry, registry.terraform.io, with public modules, verified and unverified modules. So verified modules are verified by Terraform, that they run, that they have good code. Still, unverified modules are good too, and the best part, which is not supported for no local modules, SEMWARE version constraints. Like, for VPC as said, you want to use a module, the Terraform-AWS-modules VPC AWS, and I want to use every version starting from 2.9 below 3.0. We have configure public subnets, private subnets, database subnets, it's all specific to the module, but it's nice to reuse public modules, which are really good. I otherwise, I would go insane if I have to write the whole VPC configuration every project. VPCs are not so easy. <laughs> yeah. 
Some recap, Terraform modules are what? Reusable, versatile, repeatable, they provide abstraction and encapsulation because I can reuse them in every project. It's the same one. The abstraction, like the VPC module, it's easy to configure it. So, putting them all together, I have to introduce you to new concepts of Terraform, the remote state. As said before, with the Terraform remote state, you can save the state like in S3, like in Azure block storage, which is important if you work with team, but you should also use that as a single developer. Because if you split all your modules up later with Terra Grant, you need the remote state to reference all your outputs of other modules. So, and I do this with the data Terraform remote state, which is provided by the Terraform provider. It, the configuration really looks the same. I say the backend and I say the config. And with the Terraform remote state, I have a data usage to read out my outputs of other modules. And these two parts are important for Terra Grant. I like that icon. <laughs> so, grantwork-io Terra Grant. It's on GitHub. It's a simple Go tool too. I go binary, download it, use it. So, what is Terra Grant? It's a thin wrapper for Terraform. So, instead of calling Terraform on the console, you call Terra Grant. It keeps your configuration dry. Don't repeat yourself. It allows you to work with multiple modules. And, as I said before, it manages your remote state. Let's look how you work with Terra Grant. First, you need an infrastructure modules directory, called infrastructure modules, or whatever you want to call it. There we have our internal module, as seen before. It's not a module. In this internal directory are all my local sub-modules. And I have many other modules defined. I have a module for Aurora DB, I have a module for monitoring, a module for Route 53 zone, which can be used multiple times. And in your module, you have the same structure as you would have in a whole Terraform code. Your main TF, which is important, you have your variables, you have your outputs, because in your model you need input and output. And the difference to writing a whole big bunch of Terraform code and now split it up in smaller modules, it's, yeah, okay, smaller, encapsulated, lightweight, and reusable. Because if you split it up, I have an Aurora module, it doesn't have anything to do with your web application node. It's just for your database, so they are lightweight. A difference, the remote state defined in your Terra Grant module, in the infrastructure module, is just the backend type. The rest is configured by Terra Grant with the main configuration we will see in the two next steps. So, beside your infrastructure module repository, you need a Git repository for that, you can define your infrastructure live directory. This Directory structure is how I use it. You are completely free to define your own directory structure. In this case, I use the account name of our AWS account as first level. Then I have the regions, like in AWS there are global things without regions, like Route 53 zones, IAM, and I have most of my stuff in EU Central 1. Next level is are your environments, dev, stage, production, and then I have the services. I have decided to use a two-level service structure. So I have a direct service VPC, I have sorted it into services, storage, and below them you have your terraform.tf was file, where your module is configured, which module you use, which variables you give into the input, and below them, in the directory of the account name, you have your Terraform TF VAS for global configuration. Um, starting from Terragrant 0.19, it's called Terraform HCL. Yeah. Okay, the global config 
Looks simple. Looks like our remote step before, except we have the Terra grant global config key. For Terra grant, we now define our remote step there with the backend, with the config bucket and the DynamoDB table logs. It's the same as before, but it's only defined in your one global configuration. So your remote state is already dry. The module config still uses a Terragrant key too. And the biggest notion is which module you use. You now use the infrastructure modules in your Git and with a reference for your tag. And that's the biggest part. You can versionize your infrastructure. Like this, I have a web module at version 1.9.5, which is used in dev, stage, and production. Now I have any change. Maybe it's a PC breaking change. And I have a version 2.0.0. In dev, I can reference this version, run my infrastructure for the web, and stage, production is not touched. With this directory structure, you can increase your infrastructure by versions. Um, sorry? <laughs> yeah. Which means you can upgrade your dev. You can later upgrade your stage, as you may be used. But with one look into infrastructure live repository, you know at which version your infrastructure is. You look into the dev web module. Oh, it's at 2. You look in your stage web module. Oh, it's still at 1.9. I should upgrade it. You look into your production web module. It's still at 1.9. And luckily, I have not upgraded it yet because it's Friday. Maybe you don't want to do a PC break in your infrastructure on Friday. But that depends on your workflow. I have include, which is relevant for Terragrant itself, which means Finding parent folders finds the root Terraform TF vars, which gets your remote state configuration. That's where you keep your remote state dry. And the coolest part is you can define dependencies. Your web module depends on VPC, it depends on the Aurora storage, it depends on the DB storage, which is later needed if you want to run your whole infrastructure at once. Of course, in your modules, you write your inputs, like this module has uh, an count and instance type of T3 medium. Yeah, it's <laughs> pretty simple. And instead of calling Terraform as state, you now call Terragrant, get, plan, apply, output, every command which Terraform supports you can thru call through Terragrant. And you need to because it copies your Terraform form infrastructure modules in a temporary cache directory and uses your code and combined with your TF vars. Um, of course, you want to work locally. You don't want to push every change with a tag. That's relatively easy to call Terragrant apply with Terragrant source. Use your local modules directory. And the most important part is the double slash here, because infrastructure modules is your directory. And this is the submodule in your whole repo. This is needed by Terraform and Terragrant to know exactly which submodule to use and resolve all internally locally used modules correctly. And just to run all the things, you can use Terragrant apply all, output all, destroy all. In your like dev directory, you can go to your stage directory and run all the infrastructure you have defined below this directory your web service, your database, your VPC can co be created at once because if I destroy the whole dev infrastructure because anything is damaged, I don't go into every directory, into every module down and call Terraform destroy. I just use Terraform destroy all, apply all, and get maybe one coffee or two coffee, talk a bit with other developers. Depending on the size of your infrastructure, it takes a while. Yeah keeping your variables dry. If you had noticed, I only have one global config, and in every module usage, I have a Terraform TF VAS, but I have global variables, like I use the AWS account, I use a PX project name, which I don't want to copy in every configuration. So I move those common variables into the global config file. I create a var file for region-specific config, and I create a var file 
for environment, environment specific config. This is excellent supported by Terragrant. So now I have a configuration for Terraform itself. Like, I want to supply extra arguments to every Terraform comment, and the comment is called vars. Which comment? Uh, the parameter is called vars, sorry. And to which comment I want to supply all these comments which need variables, like apply, like plan, destroy doesn't need. Destroy needs two, but I don't need to know this. Terragrant need, knows this and gives it to me. I define a few required variable files like the parent Terraform TF var, which is this same local config where I write in variables into, and the module Terraform vars itself. And I set a few optional variable files like these two for environment and these two for regions. That I have two configuration is just the case because I use a two-level uh, folder structure. Like I have the VPC and I have a services web level. So I have to set them optional and define two levels. Terragrant is intelligent enough to only use those optional WAR files which exist. Yeah, this is the resulting layout. So I still have my global config here. Now I headed my region and environment variables file. As I said before, our services web needs to go two levels up to reach the environment TF VAS, and our VPC module has to go only one level up to reach the env TF VAS. The same for the region. Yeah. It's a really simplistic file layout, and now your, all your variables are dry too, because all your variables for the region, like which you use, etc. You put in the region, you put your environment specific variables into nvar, uh, into nv.tfvars file. Now your configuration is dry too. Um, and that should be called Terragrant. <laughs> so, a quick recap. You have dry modules, dry Terraform code, a dry remote state, and dry CLI flag with it instead of big configurations, which you can't really destroy. If you put all your database, all your web server configuration, and all your VPC configuration in one big Terraform configuration, you can't call de Terraform destroy, if you only want to destroy your web nodes. And the biggest part for me is the versionized infrastructure. I can increase my, my infrastructure code for dev, stage, and prod separately. And Terragrant is still just a thin wrapper if you don't think about you have to write configuration for Terragrant. Yeah, okay. That's all so far. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, is Terra, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if I missed it. Uh, is Terragrant also developed by HashiCorp? Or no, it's, it's developed by Grantwork. Okay. Which is like a DevOps agency. Okay. And they had to, yeah, they have worked with Terraform and wanted to get their configuration dry, developed some concepts for it. And after they had the concept, they developed Terragrant as an open source project for everyone to use it. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Uh, can you give it up, please? Um, so, you were basically always applying the changes by hand. Is there also some kind of GitOps way where you basically commit your main config into a repo which is then being applied? I don't like to run Terraform and Terragrant through CI because then anyone is able to push, co uh, anyone who is allowed to push code to the repo could do terrible things to the infrastructure or just destroy it, it doesn't work. Uh, another thing is all those dependencies. The web service depends on the storage and so on. I have put it into CI, but it always makes problems. So I, ha I have done this and I don't like it. 
I prefer to run it by myself because I have the plan output. I need to know which infrastructure is modified, is destroyed, is graded. There are a few things like in AWS, if the AMI changes for the instance, Terraform wants to regrade it. I don't want to regrade it. I don't want to regrade the instance because it may be the production instance. So it's also a bit of thing about trust in your developers, in other DevOps people. For our organizations, I'm the only one which is doing DevOps and all the others are simple developers. And yeah, it's a matter of trust too. I don't trust them with infrastructure. <laughs> I've got another question. Um, how often do you run into configuration problems? If I see it right, uh, any kind of what I would like to configure on the systems need to be provided by a module or provider in Terraform. And how stable is this? Or is it, I want to be dry, so I like to steer away from complicated configuration, hotfixes, workarounds, whatever. What's your impression with Terraform over the years you use it? Terraform is really stable. All tough, it uses zero versions. It's really stable. They made a split from getting the providers out of the core, so the providers evolve separately, like new resources for AWS are added separately, have their own version versioning, have their own PC breaks with major versions, luckily. So it's really stable. New resources are added fast. Configurations problems you mostly get because you just need to know, like if you use AWS, you need to know AWS. Like you can't have the same, can't have two S3 buckets with the same name. You just need to know this. If you regrade the S3 bucket, you either use name prefix or you have to first destroy it. The standard configuration change in Terraform is to destroy the resource first and then regrade it. You can change the life cycle for it like grade before destroy. And if you have li something like grade before destroy for a three bucket with the same name, it won't work out because Terraform then wants to grade this a three bucket with the same name first. And AWS says, nay. So the most configuration problems I have because I didn't notice restriction on the AWS side. Anyone else? Okay, that was a bit too quick today, but yeah, <laughs> bigger break for you. Thank you. <laughs>